Uh, I would like to welcome everyone for our first uh, Center of Excellence for Energy online CDIO uh, session. Uh, thank you very much to our partner universities and to Professor Mats Hansen and Professor Dan Fry for uh, suggesting that we provide preliminary online sessions in preparation for uh, our in-person workshop that we hope to eventually hold uh, for partner universities here in Egypt when uh, travel restrictions are lifted and Professor Hansen is able to join us face-to-face uh, -face here in Cairo. So until that time, we are starting with uh, two, prelimin two preliminary sessions, one today and one uh, on June 22nd. Uh, and Professor Matt Hansen will be facilitating both sessions. Uh, I would like to once again thank you on behalf of MIT and the COE project team. And I would like to hand it over to Professor Mats Hansen for his introduction. Thank you, Dina, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to both develop this uh, five-day workshop and uh, also deliver, uh, together with, with colleagues, of course. Uh, my name is Mats Hansson, as you said, and uh, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, introduce myself a little bit uh, later uh, during these sessions. So, um, and I hope the slides will work for you. So the next slide is uh, just some practical things uh, to start with. Um, I hope everyone can master the Zoom video conference system, including myself. <laughs> Uh, sharing screens and mute your microphones and, and what, uh, what have you. Uh, I have divided uh, this two hour session into four time slots and we will have a five man, man, minute break between the sessions with the countdown. So you will see when I start again. So I will start on the minute. Uh, for this um, two workshops, the two uh, uh, online workshops, I don't have any formal assignments for you, but it will be in the full five day workshop later on, you will have very nice assignments. Uh, however, I will have some questions for you or some, something for you to think about. Of course, the slides will be open and shared after the sessions. Uh, some of the material organizes from people in the CDIO community, so I will thank Johan Malmqvist, Christina Edström, and many, many others, because the CDIU community, it's a lot of, of, of uh, colleagues and peers who want to share everything we are doing in the CDIO. So it's no, nothing that we don't uh, share, but um, they have to be, be uh, uh, create credit for, for the, the work they have done. And as I said, I will introduce myself a little bit more in detail so you know who, who I am. Uh, later on in this first session. So today I designed um, these two hours uh, into four parts. So we have already started with the first one, uh, welcome and uh, what we expect from the full workshop. Uh, next half an hour, we will, the, the uh, half an hour later on, we will introduce why we do the mo uh, CDIO, why should we use the CDIO and what is the process to use it. We will start also with the introduction to the standards. I know that some of you, maybe half of, of you uh, participants, have already been, been exposed to the CDIO, but I want everyone to be on the same level before the five-day workshop. So I hope everyone could, could listen into the standards and remind themselves and think about uh, other things around the CDIO standard. Uh, the last part uh, about didactics, uh, pedagogy, uh, what to teach, I think that might be new for, for all of you, uh, hopefully. So, uh, and I think that's something I want to share with you and uh, think about, so. So that's the, the four sessions. So continue with the first one, what to expect. Um, I will remind everyone, uh, and I'm happy also to see the uh, list of participants, that we have students, TAs, we, had, we have assistant professors, we have professors, we have people from the administrations, 
uh, and uh, others. Uh, so it's a, a good mix of, of people. So everyone hopefully are interested in engineering education. And I want to remind every one of you that engineering education, to be a teacher, a professor, and teach is a profession. So it's a job that you have to be skilled for. You, you need to, to uh, have skills for, for your profession. So even if uh, university do research and other things, the, the education part need to be taken as a profession. So, so the motivation and what to expect is for you to learn more about uh, engineering education. Be an informed professional academic educator, professional academic educator. And to do this, we have this methodology CDIO and I hope uh, this could be a tool to, to, uh, <clears throat> to use to, to, uh, to be more professional. But it's also a matter of expand your community of peers. We are not working uh, as teachers alone. Uh, we are working together. And I think CDIO is also a very, very good um, base for community that really want to open up international relations. Um, this workshop is one. You will know me more after this uh, workshop, but also you will expand your, your uh, community peers uh, internally in Cairo and in, in Egypt with, with the um, uh, collaborating uh, universities. The last bullet point, become an active participant. Uh, I stress that all the time. But today is an exception because I'm uh, going to be the talking head uh, today. Uh, but in the five day workshop, you can expect to be very active. So I will try to design the workshop, the full day workshop uh, that you will uh, really work hard and also together with others in teams. So I'm looking forward to come to Cairo and, and deliver that five day workshop uh, very, very soon. Um, engineering education. Uh, we have stated in the CDIU community that we want to, to graduate students who can uh, master a deep in work, uh, deeper working knowledge of technical fundamentals. This is a sentence that is coming back in the CDIU community over and over again. What it means is that we need to have engineers who can engineer who can combine the, the uh, disciplinary knowledge from physics, math, and so on, uh, and transfer it to, to, um, to the engineering world. The next bullet point has the word started with lead. I think we, our graduates should be very good leaders. They should lead the development, they should lead the research, they should lead uh, they are not working uh, by themselves uh, only. They're working in teams to lead the process, to develop new companies, new products, and new processes. At the same time, we expect our graduates to take a responsibility in the society, not only as engineers, but as, as uh, citizens uh, for the good society worldwide. So this is a little bit of a statement, uh, learning outcomes from, from our graduates. And when I'm talking about graduates, we're talking about undergraduate programs uh, in all fields. We are talking about master programs, but CDIO is also applicable for, for uh, doctor programs in some way or another. Uh, also in the different disciplines in, in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, what have you, I think you can, and even chemistry, you can use uh, CDIO uh, to, to guide you to a better, a better education, more professional education. Also remember that CDIO, the acronym CDIO is, you know, conceive, design, implement, and operate, but the CDIO is more of an idea. So 
sometimes when people ask me, what, what does it stand for, CIO? Oh, it's more than an idea that what engineers uh, students should learn to be, as I said before, engineers who can engineer. This statement was said by uh, one of the founder of CDIO, uh, Professor Ed Crawley from MIT. He recognized together with others that engineers were going to be too uh, theoretical. The, the practice, they left the practice behind and went more theoretical. So he stated that we need to to educate engineers who can engineer. So that, that's a, uh, I think that sentence is, is very, very uh, challenging and very, very good. That the CDIO is about a methodology. Uh, and we are going to, to look into the standards today and the syllabus, uh, the next session. But you should understand that this is a, a methodology that helps you to reform the, the engineering education. Uh, and it's many, many different uh, ideas behind the CDIO. And the CDIO community from, from Europe, from, from uh, uh, US, from Australia, from China, from all over the world, uh, including uh, Egypt, is a very good platform for, for developing this methodology. And it's still uh, uh, being developed. So you can also participate to, to make it better. And as I said, uh, the community, 120 universities plus, I think it's more now, uh, is, is collaborating in this open uh, uh, minded uh, mindset. So as I said before, also we share everything uh, we have a debate. Uh, you can have another viewpoint. That's that's fine. Uh, we listen to you. Uh, so so everyone can can uh, speak openly about uh, any ideas to to make the engineering education better. You can learn more. Uh, the CDIO.org. Uh, you have the website with uh, some documentation. You have conferences. Uh, you have other meetings. And you have also, uh, uh, we point out the book, Rethinking Engineering Education as a base also for, for knowing more. So, <clears throat> one of the idea with the, uh, with the workshop, the five day workshop and uh, also about academic <clears throat> education is to to understand that engineering education is within normally universities. So we focus mostly on, on the university education, even if there are some other uh, educators out there. So most academic posi positions, professors, uh, assistant professors and others uh, will combine research, education, innovation, leadership and outreach. So when I have been working at the, uh, in the academics, I'm talking a little bit more about myself now, but I want you also, as you can see in the bottom of the slide, uh, is to think about the importance and proportion of the balance in your situation. So for myself, I have done research. I have done a lot of education, more education than research, I would stress. Uh, innovation is to transfer the result from the research into to, uh, uh, to, <clears throat> to make impact uh, in the society, to, to make the ideas, to, to, uh, to innovate. And uh, in my case, I have started two companies to, to get from, from the ideas I got from the research and education and the companies I also started with students. So that was a combination to start companies, uh, startups with the students. Leadership, um, I have been uh, a leader for the university in, in many different positions. And I think the leadership is also very, very important to co combine research, education and leadership. And of course, uh, last but not least, 
Uh, we also, uh, all people at the uh, university to, uh, universities are responsible for outreach. We are, <coughs> we are uh, happy to be part of the university, but we also want to be part of the society. So we can be on seminars, we can be on workshops, we can be um, debating in the newspapers, whatever you can do, but you, you can also have a, a role in recruiting students. So from my point of view, I have been also engaged very, very much uh, in the leadership of, of KTH uh, in, in the outreach to, to recruit students. Not only in Sweden, we have been outreach in the, the whole world to get the talent students to, to our universities. So I think that's also a, a, a very good way to, to um, uh, think about uh, developing yourself as a professional educator to combine all these five in a very good mix. Uh, and everyone can do everything. <laughs> it's my, my, my uh, take on this. So uh, you don't need to say, oh, I'm only a researcher. I cannot do any leadership. I cannot go out in the outreach. I just do my research. I, I think from my point of view, I think you should be more open-minded because, because also of the results of your research. Or not only an ed educator, but also combine research and education and also innovation. So uh, to make this broad uh, take on, on education, it's not only teaching uh, some, some courses and some, some hour, lecture hours. Um, it, it is to create new courses and programs or uh, create uh, new materials in the courses. Uh, I use um, often uh, a, a, rich, a rich set of learning experience. So different types of learning experiences uh, a good mix of learning experience, it's what I, I, uh, I strive for. Of course, we do teaching and learning uh, and supervision and su supervision of students, doctor students, master students, uh, we supervise them uh, in the research for, for the thesis, for example. But you can also be an academic advisor. So you can advise the students uh, from time to time. And uh, so that's also uh, uh, one thing that I feel important. And uh, finally, in this slide, uh, you can do some education research. Uh, you, you can share education experiences and research by publishing papers uh, in, in uh, published uh, in uh, reviewed um, publications or conferences. CDIO uh, have the, the conferences. So when you do something, um, create some new courses or programs, you can also document and uh, high, uh, have some hypotheses that you try to, to uh, answer. And then you can, can write it down and you can make some measurements and con uh, conclusions and then you can publish it. So that's also part of the CDIO community to publish your results. So uh, when we're uh, coming together in the five-day workshop, uh, you will be asked to make a kind of situation plan uh, for your situation. And maybe most importantly is where do you want to head? Do you want to increase some of these research areas, innovation, leadership, outreach, um, and try to, to understand how to do that? So I will ask you to, to think about these uh, bullet points in, uh, on this slide. Um, who am I? Um, Mats Hansson is my name. Uh, I'm born in, and raised in Sweden, Stockholm, the, the capital in, in, in Sweden. I have been working, I was a student of Royal Institute of uh, Technology, KTH, in Stockholm. And I have been there uh, for 40 years. I'm retired now since a couple of years. 
uh, but uh, for 40 years I, I was at a, in, in KTH. And as you can see from, from a little uh, fraction of my CV, I have been into all these uh, bullet points, uh, research, education, innovation, and outreach, and so on and so forth. I've been to very many uh, European projects, including Egypt, and some of you knows that I've been uh, part of developing the mechatronics lab in, in uh, Cairo, in uh, Aishams. And when I visit you in January, no, in December, I was very happy to see the result from, from the, uh, the work we, uh, we did uh, more than 10 years ago uh, when we started the mechatronics uh, program in, in uh, Aishams and also the other universities. It was three universities in, in the Cairo region, uh, in, in Egypt, I should say. So I'm very, very proud and happy to, to, to see the results um, that we did. Because I started the mechatronics program uh, almost 40 years ago, 40 years ago. It was a long time when the first microcontroller, mi microprocessor came in the 1975, 76 something, before 78. I was uh, working at the Stanford University uh, in the 80s. Uh, I was also the uh, founder and director for KTH Learning Lab. We had we started the uh, four learning labs in the world, Stanford Learning Lab, uh, Karlinska Institute Learning Lab, and Uppsala Learning Lab. And then it was spreading around the world. And also I was uh, founding the CDIO community in the late 90s together with uh, Ed Crawley and other colleagues at MIT. So I was the first one introducing uh, CDIO in the world together with him and some others in the team. Um, recently, I have been to uh, Moscow in Russia, starting a new institute, uh, Skolkova Institute of Technology, Skoltech. Uh, Skoltech.ru, you can go in to look to this brand new uh, uh, top university, elite university in not only Russia, but also in, in, in the world. And I was working with MIT to develop this institute uh, from 2012 to 2016 and uh, during that uh, time I was the Dean of Education, the founding Dean of Education, uh, uh, creating together with MIT and, and my colleagues at uh, uh, other universities uh, a brand new curriculum from the beginning from a white uh, a, a paper, a white paper uh, white paper could be something else, but a, a blank sheet of paper, we created the full university. And during the five day workshop, I will share some of the insights from, from that period of time, because it was recently and it was together with many, many different colleagues. So uh, with that introduction, uh, I'm looking forward to the next session uh, in five minutes. So, uh, Thank you for this first session and uh, I will have some feedback if you could follow me. So, and please use it, the chat and the uh, quest uh, QA. Uh, so if you want to, to uh, ask some questions or have some comments, use the chat and I, I will see the, the results. So I will mute my microphone and come back in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hansen. Uh, five minute break uh, in case someone needs to get something to drink or uh, do something quickly and we will be back five minutes for the second part of the session. Thank you. Actually, we missed your drinks and the food. Uh... <laughs> مش كده برضو ربنا يجمعنا على خير ان شاء الله يا دكتور احمد ان شاء الله ان شاء الله بقول له هيك مع دكتور احمد ما تقلقش يعني في ان ريتيرن دينا هتتوصى بينا قوي يعني هتعوضنا يعني مثلا ولا ايه؟ طبعا يا حبيبي يعني انت دينا دايما من الناس اللي هم عندهم كرم زياده يعني لا لا دينا كريمه صراحه الله يخليك ميرسي يا دكتور محمد يكرمك يعني فاكر مين اللي عزم القطر يا دكتور؟ ده كان الشرقيه تقريبا مش من الشرقيه مش كده دينا لا انا من المنصوره 
طيب يعني ما شاء الله يعني برضه من الناس الحلوين يعني الله يخليك اصلا من منصوره صحيح اه كويس الناس في المنصوره قاعدين اهو مبسوطين يعني اه والله يسلمي عليهم كلهم الله يسلمك يا دينا والله منوره الله يخليك يا فندم بنورك احنا بتوع المنصوره كده لينا لينا قوه مشكله برضه اه طبعا بتعملي لوبي بقى ولا ايه هنبدا في اللوبي ايوه انا فاتني حاجه انا قمت اجيب كوبايه شاي فاتني ايه؟ كامل كامل فاتك يا دكتور نبيل ان دينا بتقول لنا ان هي من المنصوره فانا بقول لها بتوع المنصوره اللي هم فوق معقول الكلام ده؟ ده تصريح ايه يا دينا مش معقول شفت بقى يا دكتور لا 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 ده احنا كده يعني معقول يا دكتور نبيل يفوتك معلومه زي ديت وما تستغلهاش يعني انا مش حابه والله الموضوع ده خالص يعني دكتور نبيل ممكن تاخد الجنسيه مفيش مشكله ما انت بقالك مده اه انت بتقول الجنسيه وانت دلوقتي يعني يعني بتقول دكتور نبيل مش منصوري يعني لا بقى له خلاص ده هو يعني اتنقع في المنصوره مده كافيه عليه قوي يبقى منصور صحيح صحيح يا دكتور حامد بصراحه لا هي مده قصيره من من معيد لغايه استاذ متفرغ بس يعني مش اكتر يعني ما شاء الله ربنا ما تنسوش انا اسمي منصور برضو ها يعني اه اه ما ده صحيح ده الناس كلها هتبقى منصوره دلوقتي لا ما نقدرش نستنى عن عين شمس برضو دكتور تامر معانا يعني صح وعندنا زملاء من جامعة أسوان برضو أهلا وسهلا آه عايز أوريكم الزملاء اللي قاعدين معايا طبعا هم قاعدين دلوقتي بعيد عن الكاميرا بس أنا عايز أيوة ما شاء الله <تصفيق> محمد سامح ودكتور وليد ده ده وشومان ده عدد كنترول في الأول ومحمد رجب فين محمد رجب؟ آه ودكتور عوض. كمان مست... آه رجب اللي في الآخر ده أنا مش شكرا هو رجب اللي في الآخر ده <تصفيق> انا واضح ان انا حد فاتح المايك صحيح هما في دو سيستم مع بعض في نفس المكان فممكن هما اللي عملوا الايكو يعني تقريبا اه واحنا فاضل لنا كده دقيقتين مثلا فلو اي حد عايز زي دكتور نبيل كده كوبايه ميه ولا حاجه <تصفيق> وبرضه بنفكركم مره اخرى للي سامع أه لو في اي حد اثناء السيشن عنده اسئله لدكتور ماتس حابب ان هو يرد عليها بليز اتكلم أه اكتبوها في الشات وزميلتي نورهان هتبقى بتسجل الاسئله وتو ميك شور يعني ان انه دكتور ماتس شايفهم ويقدر يجاوب عليهم باذن الله برضو انا احب انبه برضو الساده بالخاصه بالسيشن الثاني يوم 22 ان الجميع هتحتفظ بالايميل اللي فيه ال اللينك الخاص بالزوم لانه هيبقى نفس اللينك. صح. يعني يا دكتور ايمن اللي حضرتك بتوضحه ان اللي عمل ريجستريشن خلاص عن طريق زوم هي هي ريجستريشن واحده هي هيخش بيها على سيشن 2 يوم 22 ان شاء الله، صح كده؟ بالظبط بالظبط. يعني هتبقى نفس اللينك ان شاء الله، صح؟ ان شاء الله. اوكي شكرا. دينا واز ذا فيرست سيشن اوكي؟ يس. All, all good, uh, Professor Matz. We can, uh, we can all hear you. Uh, everything went very well, and we are ready to start when you are. Okay, because I see the time is three ten. Yeah, I'm ready no, to start. It's just a bit of a mix-up with the timer, but you can, uh, you can start. Okay, so everyone is online now. Now I missed my. Um, can you, you hear me? You need to share your screen. Share, again. share screen. So I will share my screen. Yes, please. Mm -hmm.
Do you see my PowerPoint now? We see it, but if you can please maximize the screen so we can, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So now we are back again and I can see myself, <laughs> that's nice. Um, and I hope you can hear me. Uh, Dina, you, you make a, okay, good. So the next part, I will go into why we do the CDIO. And I can also tell you from the beginning that you can use CDIO not only when you are developing educational programs. Uh, we can do CDIO uh, when we are creating new products. And that was the basic idea between uh, to, to introduce the CDIO. Engineers love to solve problems. So <laughs> that is the engineering process. And to do this uh, traditionally and also nowadays um, you have this uh, timeline uh, that engineers conceive they are coming up with a problem statement they are coming up with some ideas they're coming up with some some uh, seed so the conceive phase is a starting point for something uh, we have formulated a problem to solve to solve the problem we have to construct or design a solution uh, and then we, when we know what we are going to, to do we can uh, do the uh, actual implementation so and then when we have produced the solution we have implemented uh, the solution we also have to operate so that was the basic idea that uh, Ed Crawley had uh, in the uh, late 90s and it's very very obvious so it's you know, it's uh, some basic uh, ideas. But this CDIO, uh, conceive, design, implement, and operate, get a very, very uh, good, uh, like engine in, in, the, uh, in the change system. So why did we start CDIO together with MIT from the Swedish side? We were looking into uh, some changes uh, in the 80s, 90s, that we got more multidisciplinary problems, more complex, we have new technologies and service, we have internationalization or globalization, we have this massive uh, starting uh, about the environment, sustainability, we have also uh, the ideas at the universities that we should be more entrepreneurial, more innovative, as we said before, we had the technical uh, things, fundamentals, design, innovation, many, many different ways. And then suddenly uh, we realized, the, the industry realized that the, the graduates uh, didn't commu communicate well. They couldn't do the teamwork. They were, uh, they were stuck to solve the problems. And I go back to, to what we said uh, half an hour ago. Uh, we were graduating engineers who could not engineer. They couldn't engineer. And we had some constraints and resources to uh, prior knowledge, faculty competence and time. Uh, engineering education was not so popular in the 80s, 90s. Uh, maybe we didn't recruit the best students. Uh, so we had many, many things. And then the e-learning uh, uh, came up also. And this is, you know, 20 years ago. So now we are using e-learning because of, of, the, uh, uh, of the virus. But uh, we were thinking about the e-learning tools already 20 years ago. But this is not the point. The, the point is actually that it was remarkable similarity across the world. So we realized that if we could collaborate, then we could develop the engineering education more, more efficiently. So, so we were thinking about to have some pedagogical innovations worldwide, to collaborate, to educate engineers who can develop the, the better future. So that was the motivation for starting 
CDIO together to collaborate and, and make it worldwide because there were so many similarities. So central questions when we start uh, the CDIO is what is the role of the professional, what is the professional role and practical context of the professionals, the need. So what we did extensively in the start of the CDIO, we went out to the industry, both in, in US, in Sweden and elsewhere, to make uh, investigation, what is the local need? Uh, and by local, we can, we can have a region like the Cairo region, or we can have a country like uh, Egypt or Sweden, or we can have a, a continent like US or Europe or Africa. So what is the real uh, role of professional in this uh, practical context? So this in extensive interviews were, was done and is still uh, done. And I'm also thinking about in the five day uh, workshop we are going to have later on, we are looking into the results, uh, recent results, what, what the needs are. And when we know the needs, we have to figure out what kind of knowledge, skills and attitudes uh, the st students should pose uh, when they graduate from our programs. We have to define the programs, the, the bachelor program, the master program, whatever. And we are doing this normally by, by the learning outcomes. And I know from, from my visit in, in uh, Cairo in December that you have done a great job uh, doing this uh, kind of, of exercise uh, to do the, the uh, program learning outcomes uh, on the program level, but also on the course level. I think that's great. But it's necessary to, to always uh, uh, also uh, see if you can improve because the, the uh, world uh, changes all the time, especially now with, with the corona. So many different uh, actions are taking in different uh, parts of the world to be creative and innovative to solve problems that is coming up uh, by the disease. And also, how can we do better ensuring that the students learn these skills? So I think we have done a lot in the CDIO community to go firstly from teaching to learning, but also have, uh, as I said in the first session, a rich set of, of learning experiences. Not only courses, not only coursework, not only uh, exams, but a, a rich set of learning experiences. And you learn 24, almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's not only when you are, are at the university you are learning, you are learning uh, on the way to the university and back home, at home, uh, when you exercise, whenever you do something, you learn. Uh, so I think we should include this kind of, I, I call it sometimes also extracurricular. So you have credits for credits, courses for credits, and then you have activities uh, that is uh, extracurricular. That is also very, very important from my point of view. So this is a central question to, to see the education uh, broader than only a course in, in a program. Uh, we are going to look into also the, the CDIU syllabus, uh, the next, uh, uh, session on uh, two weeks in two weeks from now what about the what because the curriculum is so loaded with content so if we want to introduce some new content uh, we have to skip something else so when you define what should be included uh, we use the CDIO syllabus as a tool also how and that's about uh, what kind of teaching methods should we use? And what kind of, and CDIO have a rich uh, set of tools uh, and that is stated in the standards. And we are looking into the standards in, in just a few minutes on how we can do this. 
uh, on the university level. So, uh, and also the design of the curriculum, from what to how, we have some tools in the, in the CDIO community helping um, both uh, professors and teachers, but also uh, the, the uh, management of, of the programs, the program manager, uh, vice rector for education, what have you. So we need some tools and because um, to give a full, say, four-year bachelor program for the students, uh, it involves many, many uh, uh, participants in, in terms of, of academic um, professors. Uh, and to see the full program, you have to understand what your little part is compared to the full comp complexity of the, the full program. And uh, the uh, curriculum design process is a help in this case. Of course, we have to assess ourselves. So uh, depending on, on, uh, on uh, how well the program is running, we have also to assess not only the students to see that they learn what we, we think they should learn uh, from the learning outcomes, but we also have to assess uh, the, the program itself. Sometimes it's connected to what worldwide is, is called the accreditation process when some uh, accreditation body is coming from outside and look into your, uh, our programs and, and uh, see if we fulfill the requirements nationally. But also, it's, I think it's a, the self-assessment evaluation is, is uh, more important, actually. So, this slide shows a vision for, for the CDIO-based education. So, as I said, the curriculum is normally uh, organized around uh, supporting courses. Um, when I was working at Skoltech in Moscow, we were talking a lot about uh, compulsory courses and elective courses. And how this balance between electives and, and um, compulsory courses uh, build the program. And I think that's also a very nice, a very good discussion we can have in the five-day workshop, uh, how to, to uh, organize our courses so they could be uh, beneficial for also students from other areas. So we get the cross uh, fertilization, uh, uh, around the, the courses and programs. CDIO stresses also uh, what we call the, the design and build projects. Um, I will remind myself that my university, if I say my university, KTH in Stockholm, have the signum uh, that KTH is uh, science and art. So we have two words, or actually three, science and art. And this was stated uh, 1850 something, almost uh, 200 years ago, science and art. That means that engineers should combine the results from the science, mathematics, physics, uh, mechanics, uh, chemistry, with the art, and art uh, is not only painting, uh, doing paintings. Art is also uh, making the artificial. Um, so the artificial is what you uh, have done by your hands, uh, creating something. So if you combine science and art, you got engineering, right? At the same time, I think in the 1800 something, uh, MIT was also established, and then they have uh, their uh, motto, uh, minds and hands. That's similar, you know, minds, your brain, and hands. So combining brain and hands, that's engineering. So, so I think 
the rich set of, of design and build project enhance the combination of science and, and uh, technology. Science, if you think, uh, uh, science and, and uh, uh, minds enhance. So think about that, minds enhance, science and, tech, uh, science and art uh, at the KTH. Um, then we have to integrate the professional skills uh, as uh, teamwork and communication skills and so on and so forth. Uh, during the five day workshop, we will, you will uh, be trained in, in this area too, because we are going to have a very active five days when, where you are going to talk more than I will talk. So <laughs> I think that's a, a good sign. I think also we will introduce the possibility to work uh, together, but also with the industry. So uh, the industry driven projects, and I know from my visit again in, in December, that you were starting some very, very interesting projects together with the industry. And I learned that the industry want to, to improve or expand uh, this uh, collaboration with, with all your universities in, in, in Egypt. So I think if we can together uh, involve the industry more and the student get more more uh, feeling for what kind of real problems uh, we are going to solve in the future within the curriculum, within the courses, I think that would be great. So, um, with that, I go to the next slide. The CDIO stress is all the time that we always can do better. Like, uh, you know, um, Toyota and other uh, companies, uh, you can uh, always improve what you are doing. And you should be open with it. If you make a fault, you should be open with it. Uh, I make mistakes and I can do it better. So from my, my point of view, we are going to work with the curriculum, of course. We can do the curriculum better. Uh, we shouldn't hesitate or we shouldn't uh, think that everything we have in the curriculum today, we need to have tomorrow. Uh, when I was the dean of, uh, the dean of mechanic, mechanical and materials engineering at KTH um, 1993, we started a new program or we, we revised a program. We divided mechanical engineering into two programs. And then I stated that the, the course in, in solid mechanics that was uh, 12 credits was not in the curriculum anymore. So, and the people from, from, from that department get crazy on me. You know, they, they had lost the course and the, the, the major course in, in solid mechanics, 12 credits was gone because I claimed that we don't need it. I was joking a little bit but they, they got uh, very, very upset. Um, then of course we were discussed it for a long time in the curriculum commit, uh, committee, and then we came up with, with the, uh, a solution that was in my mind, a very, very, very good solution. So we had to, to, um, to look, in, uh, look into the curriculum uh, and I will be happy to help uh, in, in, uh, when we meet again. Of course, we have to, to revise teaching and learning methods uh, all the time. And, you know, we have so many tricks, we have so many uh, possibilities to, to make a more uh, active uh, learning for the students, including the students. And I will state again that the, the CDIO community always, always, always invites students to participate in the process of, of um, revising or, or developing the curriculum and the teaching and learning methods. Uh, and I'm so happy that we have at least two, three teaching assistants with us today. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I, I really like to, to have more TAs and other students involved, if possible. And uh, to the stu students who are here, please um, ask other students to participate in, in the creation of new courses and new teaching and learning methods. The, the, uh, 
the design and implement exercises, as I said before, is very important and I will be happy to share uh, many, many student oriented projects and I learned from my visit also in, in December uh, that you have the formula student project, we have, you have other uh, sun uh, and the windmill projects and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think we can, can increase uh, the, the quality and also the learning experience a lot by, by sharing uh, ideas around this one. Learning assessment methods, of course, not only exams, and I think this maybe Corona online thing will also uh, expose uh, new methods of, of uh, assessment. Uh, faculty, uh, faculty competence, um, again, thank you also. All the ma major part of the participants today are from the faculty and I'm so happy that you uh, take the time and interest and I'm looking forward to, to work with you and I, I know that you are working very, very hard uh, in, in all your three universities to, to, um, to promote not only CDIO but also promote uh, the faculty competence in, 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 in the large scale. Um, I have experience, for example, to, to run courses for uh, student su supervision in uh, doctor courses. That is also really important to, to be a good supervisor for, for the PhD students. So I wanna, will be happy to share it uh, with you um, later on. Program evaluation is, is also a part that we, we need to do. So this is some of the things we uh, always can do better. And uh, the, here's a, also something that we should re remind ourselves. Um, as I said before, CDIO is a reference model, not a prescription. It's very, very important that uh, you don't take everything I say for granted. You should be a, a, a critical thinker and uh, you should do your own, uh, your own um, challenges on this. And as I heard, take what you want to use, transform it and we, uh, as you wish and give it, give it a new name. I think that's a good one. It created from I think you are Mount Christ or Ed Crawley. Just take it, transform it and, and give it your name and be proud of it. So uh, finally, um, the local faculty ownership is key. And not only the, the faculty, the faculty in the broad sense, but the, uh, also the leadership of the, the university is a key. So I'm also happy to see in the participants today, listening to this one, that uh, as you are part of, of this game, uh, the ownership uh, from your side is, is key. And all the way down to, to uh, the last or first student in, in the first uh, class, the first day in the semester, they should be engaged in, in owning the university, owning the program, owning their own learning. So uh, with that said, um, I'm ready to take a break and uh, also looking forward to uh, discuss a little bit more in detail the CDIO standards the next half hour. And then I'm looking back to the, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the um, didact didactics part. So Dina, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Matz, I'm not sure. Uh, I believe that Norhan had indicated you would be taking some questions during the break. So will that be during this break? Uh, I'm ready. I'm sitting here. So uh, okay. uh, I, I have sent before, the I questions. I have the, sent the questions to the chat, to your chat box. Doc. Okay, I will try to find my chat box then. Mm. Uh, I think I need to stop sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Just take a look I'm at looking, your private I'm chat. I'm looking to the, to the chat. I'm looking to mm -hmm. the chat. All right.
If it's at all helpful, I could um, read you the questions one by one, or if you prefer reading them on your own and, and answering, it's completely up to you. I couldn't unmute. I was into the chat and I couldn't see the unmute. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, it will be fine because uh, I saw so many um, chat in this uh, to start with, you know, say okay. hello, hello. Okay. So take a few of them and I try to, to answer them. Okay. So um, Dr. Mona Abulayez, she, she says she noticed that you, ho you hold many positions related to different engineering bodies with different backgrounds. Um, how do you recommend to get the best use of this CDIO experience? Okay. Mona Abolash. Dr. Amona Abolash. Dr. Amona. Yeah. Amona. Um, that's a very broad question, isn't it? Um, so but, I think maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, what your intentions are for the more tailored workshop when you're here. Um, so that if Dr. Mona is planning on attending, she, she knows what, what you plan to focus on. Yep. Okay, I'll try. Okay. Um, next one. Okay, the next question or the next comment was by uh, Professor Mohi Mansour. He, he was commenting specifically on slide number seven, um, suggesting that you perhaps may want to consider adding uh, another element, which is community service. And he was asking what your thoughts are on that and if you think that that would be well, a good add. Th that's a good question. Okay, slide number seven. And then? Okay. Um, the next one. Also from Dr. Mona Bolaez, uh, she would like you to please give an example uh, of a course to show the differences in content and uh, changes in teaching methods, mm -hmm. if that's possible. And yes. our final question, I believe if I'm reading these uh, correctly, is from uh, Dr. Aydel uh, Um He says, you have a lot of teaching experience in Sweden and Russia and you've uh, visited Egypt uh, a few times. Uh, if you could please give us some differences between the education system in your view uh, in these countries, how, how they mainly differ. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's, uh, these are the questions that I have uh, in yes, front of me. Yes, we only have four questions so far. Okay, so good. Did you want to maybe touch on those broadly? Yes. Uh, are the participants online right now? Yes, they are. From, uh, I will uh, share my screen. So Professor uh, Mass, before you share your screen, just for planning purposes, how, will you be responding to the questions at the end of the session? Yes. Yes, so at the end of the session, you will respond to all the questions that are posed, correct? Yes, right. Right. correct. Thank you very much. Yeah, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, and you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Please go right. ahead. And you can see the screen? Yes, we can yes. see it. 
but uh, it's not... If you could just please maximize your view so we could... Yeah, uh... but maximize is not working here. Um, no. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. it Thank was, you. It was, a, it was a little bit delayed. Okay, I understand that, that you all are back again. And uh, Dina just told me that I got uh, four questions on the chat and uh, I, I just briefed them down or, or um, learned about the four questions. I'm going to think about the answers to the end of uh, the next session. So uh, in part four, I will try to, to answer the questions. And during this session, you, you can post more uh, on the chat box. And if I cannot, um, if I cannot um, answer the questions right now, I will uh, take them back home and uh, uh, read them and uh, answer either on mail or uh, in the next session, the next uh, two weeks to come on Monday, the 22nd. So um, continue with part three, uh, introduction to the standards. And again, uh, I know that many of you have already uh, looked into the standards. And uh, so, but I will, I was also asked to do this presentation as a, a pre, for the pre-workshop, uh, as a pre-workshop for the five day. So uh, when you attend the five day workshop, we can uh, move faster. And actually one of the questions from the chat was um, to give examples for what we're going to cover on the five day workshops. So I want, want to try to, to introduce it as we go. And <clears throat> The, the standards are actually uh, a very good guideline, uh, not only for, for uh, faculty members, but also for the, the uh, uh, leadership of the university. And the leadership is, is often fa faculty. So if I go through them briefly here, uh, we have five parts. Uh, the first one is about uh, the CDIO context and the syllabus. We are going to talk about the syllabus uh, next time uh, more in detail, but the syllabus and the context is what is the, the uh, program all about. And I will also give you some hints how to answer this question in the next part, in the fourth um, part today, in, in half an hour, I will go into how to define the, a program, how to define a course. What sh should we uh, include? And I'm coming, coming back to that uh, in, in a minute. Then you have the uh, standards uh, three, four, five, six about the uh, curriculum itself, how to design the curriculum. Uh, especially, I'm co also coming back to the CDIO workspaces uh, that I think is for, for me personally, for me personally, very, very, very important. Um, teaching and learning, uh, seven and eight. Also, as I said, in the five-day workshop, I'm going to, to, uh, to work with this part of integrated learning experience and active learning uh, uh, very much because I think uh, the students need to be active to learn. Passive students don't learn uh, so much that they learn almost nothing if they are, are passive. They have to be active, so this is a very important part. Faculty development, nine and 10, and then the assessment and evaluation uh, on uh, 11 and 12. Uh, I made this slide so you can see a little bit more in detail what we are going to cover. Uh, the first one, I'm not going through all the 12, but I will give you some examples uh, that I think is maybe more important than the others, maybe. Every, every, everything is important here. Uh, but the co context is again, the connection to what the graduates should do when they graduate. What do the society, the companies expect from our graduates? So uh, you in this part, we have to go out, uh, from the university out in the society and meet uh, with um, 
we meet with the the guys who are going to to uh, uh, employ uh, our students and as i said we did it in the cdio community extensively uh, many many uh, interviews with industry and so on and so forth so i will focus um, uh, some time during the five-day workshop on, on the context. I think also what we can do uh, according to the context but also to, to the integrated curriculum is to describe the, the, uh, uh, the curriculum and the program for uh, students that, the, that we want to attract. So students in, in the high school and gymnasium uh, want to know why should they go this program and if, if we formulate what the program is all about and what it's leading to i think we can make a difference so in the context and the integrated curriculum we can also try to describe our program for other stakeholders uh, students and also uh, the, the companies um, we we are going to work with the learning outcomes frame, framework so that's another uh, thing that you can expect uh, and i know that you have done uh, in ishams and, and the other universities also an extensive job to understand how to formulate learning outcomes but coming also from learning outcomes to, to the real uh, outcome uh, in the student learning uh, is a challenge so i think we should work with with the learning outcomes um, as part of the standards we are also going to look into how we introduce the students uh, to the int introduction to engineering. Um, for example, at Skoltech in, in Moscow, we introduced um, what we call a three week uh, innovation workshop. The first day when the students came to the university they were put into a, an extensive active workshop that we call the innovation workshop now skoltech have extended this innovation workshop to eight weeks because they thought it was a so good idea it was so forming the students they were welcome, welcoming the students to the to the um, to the university and also learn the students that active learning is the way we are going to teach them so in this introduction course to, to engineering as one of the standards that need to be uh, in the in the program uh, we have to look into what what is the real content uh, and, uh, and the outcome from this course um, i was talking uh, earlier about the importance of a design implement exercise to combine science and art, heads and minds, and uh, working uh, with the technical fundamentals to do something real. And I think this is also a very motivated uh, for the students to, to be part of. And in these online uh, times, it could be a challenge to actually, uh, actually do a design implement exercise online. I haven't tried it, but uh, I'm lo maybe looking forward to it. But I prefer to be in the lab and in the workshop uh, and the um, in the garage, so to speak, to do this. Um, if we are looking into the number six of the standards, uh, it's about engineering workspaces, um, classroom, uh, so to speak. Um, I have done many 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 different projects around building up teaching and learning facilities changing classrooms auditoriums to to something else uh, and also use other spaces for for the learning we have uh, rebuilt the library we have done many many things both in moscow and, and in sweden and also in europe so i i have a lot of materials and, and experience in in uh, the relation between learning and how to fa facilitate learning. So um, I think I can share a lot of experience in, in, in standard six with you in, in the workshop, in the five day workshop. Um, integrated learning experience uh, about the personal and interpersonal skills. Uh, 
I think that's extensive in, in the CDIO and we are going through this integrating learning experience with, with the personal and interpersonal skills. Um, I also have some materials that I might share the next uh, in, in two weeks. I, I'm not quite sure yet or if I should uh, save it to the five day workshop about active learning. Um, I, I skipped this one, faculty skill competence, we will uh, cover. Uh, I would say um, in some way or another and also integrated, we will cover all these CDIO standards extensively during the five day workshop. And it, it's interwoven with it, each other also. So if you see them all, uh, you can make connections between the context and, and the active learning and we can make a, uh, lines between integrated learning experience and, and uh, learning outcomes. So everything is integrated in, in each other. Um, okay, let's see how long time I should go into this one. Um, I go to the next slide because it's also about the standards and there are <coughs> We, we have the 12 standards, and then we have another standard for the self-evaluation. Uh, self so, and the self-evaluation is about benchmarking our development and scholarship and learning. Um, so we will do, during the workshop, we will do some self-evaluation. So, and there is a, a scheme or a method to do this self-evaluation, the benchmarking. So, we will do this for, for each standard. We will assign a rating, zero to five. So this is something I'm going to ask you to do as a, an assignment. Uh, so, and if we do this as an assignment and you pick your program or whatever you want to pick, uh, the full university or a program, we are going to make some kind of, of research in terms of um, collecting all your input and then try to see if we can uh, draw some conclusions from, from your rating uh, on your program. So for all the standards, you are going to rate from zero to five uh, according to a scale. And then we will uh, conduct this self-evaluation process annually to, to make progress. Maybe you are doing it uh, right now. I'm, I'm not quite sure, I had to check, but um, I, I think even if the uh, some committee at the university is doing this uh, right now, I think it's a, a good exercise for, for you all to be involved to, to try to, to discuss how you rate, uh, what is a two, what is a three, what is a four, and so on and so forth. So you, you got some experience on, on, on rating. Uh, one idea is also with this uh, uh, self-evaluation process and to learn more about it is for you as a faculty member to be included in some committees uh, at your university in Egypt or in uh, uh, internationally. I myself have been an evaluator internationally for many times. Uh, last time I was uh, evaluator in EU in Brussels for, for some program in uh, master program in design. So um, it's also a good exercise if you have the ambition to be uh, an international expert in the field. And I think CDIO is a good um, way to start even if uh, this is, is broader. So with that one, I'm a little bit early, but I think we take the five minute break right now and then I can um, can prepare to to uh, to answer the questions. So I'm a little bit fast now, so we we take the break. Okay, we can take a five minute break. Five minute break. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Some more questions on the chat. Yes, we do have some more questions. Uh, Dr. Reda Hassan is asking. Um, 
if uh, CDIO workspaces require different settings or have specific requirements. Uh, Dr. Okay. Mirvet Aburkhir, uh, she'd like to know what you mean by when you use the term interpersonal. Mm -hmm. And I believe these are the only two new questions that have okay. come up. Um, can, no can, you, can we repeat the, the first four? The first one was about use experience from Amona. And yes. And she, she Dr. also. Dr. Amona wanted, had a couple of questions, yeah. Yeah. The first one was. The first one was. Um, about your, uh, your different backgrounds. Can best benefit from uh, your experience uh, with CDIO, uh, given your experience in different organizations, and maybe talk a little bit more about what you plan on on doing when you come for the tailored yeah. workshop. Right. And I believe her second question is about um, if you can give an example uh, of a, a specific course to show the differences in content uh, related to teaching uh, methodology. Changes in teaching methodology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I got that one. You made a comment about uh, adding community service to. Yes, on slide number seven. Mm -hmm. Right, and Dr. Idle made a comment about um, if you can elaborate on the differences in, in teaching and education systems uh, between Egypt and Sweden and Russia, uh, the other countries that you're familiar with. Yeah. So that's okay. just a recap of all the questions, and mm -hmm. uh, we yeah. really address them towards the end. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to take them in the end. So, okay, that's great. So in a couple of minutes, I will take the, the last one and about didactics, and then I will answer the questions. Thank you very much. And the timer is working now? Timer is working, so just a little over two minutes. It, it was a little bit of, of tricky to go back when I have to go uh, to... Oh, I think the mic. Yeah, I know. Mm. I need to find my PowerPoint, but I think I know how to do it now. <laughs> I have to okay. click and see. Because the screen is changing all the time, so sometimes I have Small icons and big icons, you know, yeah. <laughs> so the it screen is, is changing. It is tricky. It is, you're right. It took, you know, I think we all um, just took a crash course in Zoom very quickly ever since uh, COVID started because we, we were just thrown into a situation where we have to rely um, very heavily on it. So yeah. I think we're, we're becoming very familiar with it quickly. Okay. So Professor Matz, if you need a drink of water or a Yeah, I have. Quick. Yeah. Okay, good. You know, Dina, the, uh, the Zoom program was initiated uh, back last century in Egypt in the TV, in Egyptian TV. And uh, that was a very, very famous program. And really? Yes. And uh, now it, it becomes one of the famous programs as well for communication. <laughs> huh. mm, yeah. Great. So come along. <laughs> yeah, that was a very famous program. Uh, I think it was back in 1970s. Yeah, or in 19. In 19. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, we have a channel now talking about uh, all the episodes and stuff like that. Uh, Maspir was a man. And uh, you can see that program nowadays. Hmm. Okay, Professor Matz, when you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, so, go ahead. So, share my screen.
Here we go, right? Um, now I have the same problem with, no, here we go. And then I change my screen a little bit. Sorry for this. I could, you couldn't see. No, it looks see? good. Yeah. We can, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 it looks good. But my screen doesn't look good. Doesn't look good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to see what I'm doing also. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, as a uh, teacher and faculty members, I'm always interested in uh, if you're still there in the classroom or if you went home. <laughs> So we will see later on. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. Uh, this session is a little bit different because uh, it's new, not for me, but uh, I haven't uh, included in, in the CDIO community before. Uh, I have done it uh, as part of my, my work and my research at KTH when I developed the mechatronics program. And also we had some discussions back in Moscow uh, but not extensively. So, so I'm happy to get feedback on this session because I, I think, yeah, I, I shouldn't say more. I, I should just go ahead. It's about didactics. Um, didacti didactics is a part of, of um, the pedagogy, as you know, but the, the word uh, didactics uh, is uh, translated differently in different parts of the world. So the uh, the uh, English speaking world have some um, interpretation of the word didactics and we in, in Sweden and elsewhere have another interpretation of the didactics. So don't be confused if you have uh, another view on, on the word didactics. But didactics is uh, uh, about the theory of teaching and it can maybe looks a little bit old fashioned because nowadays we are going from teaching, teaching methods to, to, um, to more learning. And uh, we have uh, other research in engineering education about the, the student learning and the student learning processes. Um, what about this part of the didactics? Um, this was part of the research, a professor in pedagogy in, in, in Sweden, Lars Ove Dahlgren, did uh, some years ago. Unfortunately, he passed away for, for uh, last year, so he's not with us anymore. But Lars Ove did uh, some good research in, in didactics, both on the university level, but also on, on the high school level. So he was... Uh, investigated what unique uh, with particular subject and how the subject should be taught or ought to be taught. So in, in a very, very brief, uh, he did work on the way to identify and describe the identity and the legitimacy of the subject to be taught. And continue to analyze the selection and communication of the material that will be included in the program. So, so this is what we do. The first, the first question you have to, to ask yourself, if you're thinking about, you can think about the course you are teaching right now, what defines the identity of the subject? or the course or the program. And how should you describe it? What, what, is, what is it all about? Is it, and Dahlgren said that on the line, it could be more disciplinary oriented or the subject could be more them thematic. That's one way to see it. If it's on the left side, disciplinary, you are thinking about academic disciplines like mathematics, physics, chemistry, solid mechanics, maybe something uh, uh, similar to those, where you have had for years, for centuries, for hundreds of years, a, a research area that you have collected knowledge and materials for a long time 
and the, the knowledge is structured in a good way. And when it's, you have this knowledge base structured in a good way, you have to take a subject in linear algebra, okay? Most of the researchers and, and uh, the community around mathematics and linear algebra know what the identity of this subject is. It's quite well defined, probably. If you go to solid mechanics, the same, you have different types of solid mechanics or parts of solid mechanics. Uh, you have also uh, other uh, topics where you quite well know the identity of the topic because it's so well uh, known and it's uh, a lot of research around this one. On the other hand, on, if you go on the line more to the right, you find areas that, that this, the identity is more thematic. You, you can take an example right uh, uh, around the environment, environmental engineering, it's more thematic. It includes the mathematics and so on and so forth, but the, the scope is more thematic. Um, I, I will say that if we go to traditional uh, subjects and courses and program, traditionally they are at the university more disciplinary. Recently, we have seen the development of more thematic program, recently the last 20 years in the thematic, but it's a, you know, a shift between. If you are looking into how the university is organized and they're working, it's more disciplinary. If you are looking into how the industry is working, it's more thematic. So from my point of view, you shift from, from the one side to another, depending on, on how you ident uh, make the identity of what you are trying to define. Right, uh, I'm going, I just click, I, I lost myself here. So now I can see myself also. Good. Um, next one. You remember the next one? The identity and the legitimacy of the subject or the program. So why? Why should we include this in, in, in the mechanical engineering program or the whatever program or in the subject? You can make this on, on the smaller scale in the subject. Why should it be included? Dahlgren said that it could be either formal requirements. Some, someone else specify formally that you need to have this in your program for some reason. It could be uh, that the graduates should be, uh, have a legitimation. So in, in uh, medical education, when you, uh, you uh, graduate doc medical doctors, they have to have a formal uh, approval of, of, uh, uh, of the education. So you got requ requirements from, from outside. It could be a formal requirement from, from other that you need to have this one. But it's another aspect of the formal. I'm coming back to the formal. But if you move a little bit to the right, to the functional uh, legitimacy, uh, that you should, the students should, should uh, be able to do something with the knowledge they have. So, uh, for example, as I said, engineer who, uh, who can engineer, they should go out there and use the knowledge functionally to solve a problem. And they can do it, you know, uh, maybe ad hoc uh, or any method is, is valid as soon as, uh, as long as they, they solve the problem. Whatever the two, uh, tools they use, it's okay as long as they solve the problem. Formally, this could be a little bit tricky if you do it in the wrong way, so to speak, that you have methods that are approved and then you do it in the wrong way. It could be another uh, aspect of formal and functional. It could be also an aspect, it could also be an aspect that the, the formal is more it's more important to make it right. If you have a language course and you have a spelling, and then if you spell the, the word wrong, you get wrong in the, uh, uh, in the um, assessment. 
when you have the, the final exam. If you have an exam and you're misspelling something or if the grammar is wrong, you, you fail because formally it's wrong. But if you have a, a small misspelling on the functional side, you can still understand uh, what, what the purpose is. So functionally it's working, but formally it's not working. So you have this uh, also balance between the legitimacy on the subject, if it's okay to be functional, but not formally, and the way around. So try to define in your subject, is it more important than it's functional, or is it more important that it's formal? This could, for example, uh, change the way of the assessment of your course. Because it's for more formal, you can have more written exams. It's uh, more functional, you can have oral uh, exams or, or a project or whatever to, to make it work. So this is a little bit about the legitimacy and the, the identity of the subject. Now, if we answering these questions, why by one? We have the answer on the first one and the second one, we can move to the third one what to teach. So then you have to define the selection. What should be included? Because we, you might have a credit limit, you might have a, a number of hours uh, as a limit uh, or whatever the limits are. Mostly there are a limit because in a subject like mathematics, you cannot teach everything, not even in solid mechanics or, or whatever you, you take. Um, as a, as, a, as a subject. So you have to define what should be included, the selection process. Dahlgren again said that it's two ways to think about this. Either that you can represent a, a structured way to go through one, two, three, four, five and cover a little, a little bit of all. So, so you take the representation of the subject and try to cover it on one side. Or you can say that we just take a small slice and make it as an example of the subject. So we se select an example and then we go extensively in this example and, and try to learn as much as possible. And then we say, okay, we can skip the rest. So if you learn enough in, with this example, you learn the subject good enough. Um, so I, I think if we go back also to the more disciplinary way of the representation, it's more uh, disciplinary. And the exemplification is more problem-based. So we have, if we go through the problem-based learning, we move into the pedagogy and the didactics in terms of exemplification, uh, exemplification, exemplification, right? So here you have to understand it's not zero and, and 100%, but you, you can go a little bit of representation and more exemplification, exemplification or yeah, moving around this scale. Now we have decided what to select, what is important in, in, the, in the subject. And the legitimacy is, is uh, okay, this is okay to do this way. Now the fourth question is how to teach. And Dahlgren again said that you can go either through the action, and this word is a little, I have to explain this word action because it's uh, oriented toward one way communication. Uh, like uh, I'm talking head right now, I'm talking to you, I, I'm, I am in action and I try to, to explain for you the Dahlgren didactic model by action. It could be also student action that they are uh, reading themselves. So if, if a student could learn alone, this is the, the way to do it. So you have to 
communicate your your teaching model uh, around learning by individual action on the other hand if you go to interaction you are going to to do it like in teamwork project work when many people maybe with different backgrounds have to interact to learn the subject depending on the selection depending on the legitimacy and the identity of, of what you are going to teach so this selection and then you're coming to the communication model and say oh we better do it interactive and now i can also answer one of the questions on the chat uh, about interpersonal skills so if you do it with interaction you are training the students interpersonal skills but because the interpersonal skills is connected to teamwork between people interpersonal between people how they interact it's also connected to leadership so if you are going to train leadership you have to do it in an interactive way otherwise you cannot train leadership so it's obvious if you have on the learning outcome that you should train the students to leadership as one part of the cdio it's not a good idea to to have action oriented communication model so try to avoid that one if the learning outcome is more to to train the interaction so problem based learning is also more oriented to this one and uh, uh, traditional lecture uh, and uh, ha have a lecture and and uh, auditorium based uh, uh, communication is uh, uh, oriented to this side so communication model lectures uh, and and uh, auditorium based uh, is on this side and projects and uh, this uh, design and build exercises are, are more more toward this side on the, on the scale um, so i will ask you in the full workshop to um, and also another question on the chat was to exp what to expect for the five day workshop <laughs> here is what you can expect uh, as part of the workshop uh, that we are going to take one of your subjects um, if it's a program or a course or whatever you you choose you will identify and describe the uh, identity and legitimacy of, of that part and we are going to analyze the selection what you select uh, why do you uh, take uh, that part that you, you you took and how do you communicate it how do you uh, make it to, to learning teaching and learning we will uh, also that's my idea at least uh, that we will discuss it in in, in the five-day workshop and you will criticize uh, the uh, each other and uh, give feedback and try to learn from the others and and it will be very interesting to see what you are coming up with but what you have to come up with is actually that you have a subject that you you will want to describe if you don't teach uh, any subject we we have to you have to define something that you are familiar with and uh, maybe maybe create a new course so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to to see what you you can can do it okay so Lars Ove Dahlgren uh, did for me actually a good job to to create this uh, very simple four questions about the identity of the subject the legitimacy why why is it important everything is important but you have to state that this is really important in in one way or another we have to select why do you select what you select uh, did you select the, the same thing that you did last year maybe it's easy to, uh, easy way to go could you select something else uh, and it will be the same outcome or or even better can you select something else and skip something do you need to to include everything no yes uh, skips something so you can can uh, talk about this one and how do you teach it 
is it possible to, uh, that the student can learn by themselves? Could you make some other exercises? Could you, can you use an online course from Coursera to, to, um, to communicate the content? It might be a perfect uh, course in uh, artificial in intelligence, machine learning on Coursera that you can use to communicate this one. So select the course from Coursera and then you can, can uh, uh, learn from that one. Okay, uh, guys, I, that was a little bit of, of didactics. Uh, next time, um, we are going to cover, as I plan, I, I will give, uh, you will give feedback uh, on the chat and I will learn from the feedback. But what I have proposed to cover uh, the next uh, Monday, the June 27th, uh, 20, uh, 22nd uh, is uh, introduction to the syllabus, as I said before, the learning outcome framework, um, online CDO, a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for me too, also. And then we will uh, cover the questions and answers session uh, from the chat. And uh, I might uh, also add something that I have in mind for, for, for the Monday. So, Dina, I will try to cover some of the questions I re already received on the uh, on the chat, and uh, I got the question about interpersonal skills, and I think I answered that one. It's about teamwork. It's about leadership. It's uh, to interact with others. Um, I, I got the question about uh, CDIO workspaces. Uh, if they're special spaces. From my point of view... Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Mass. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I think I, I might be you. having some uh, internet problems. I can hear you, actually, but your, your uh, microphone seems to be muted. No, it's not muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I was just having some uh, internet problems. So we did receive a few more questions uh, while you were doing the uh, didactic session. Did you want me to run through those really quickly. Yeah, is, every, uh, is everyone listening? Everyone's listening. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we received a uh, question from Professor Ayman uh, Mohammed. Is, is there any applicability or adaptation to implement CDIO with the current situation of COVID-19 e-learning? So I guess what he means is, do you have any suggestions for implementing CDIO amidst the current um, crisis uh, thank you for the thank you for the question uh, actually um, what I was thinking of is just to bring it up uh, the next uh, time in this okay. time slot the online okay. CDIO a challenge and All right. what I intend to do for your understanding is to take some contacts during the two weeks and see if I can learn from what they are doing right now in, in my community of peers so I'm coming back. Okay. The next uh, question raised was from uh, Dr. Mohammed Awad uh, in Mansoura. He was uh, talking specifically about the mechatronics programs uh, program, saying that it's an interdisciplinary program, uh, but there are courses that are more thematic. Uh, he says, however, most of the courses are rather disciplinary. So he would like to know more about your experience related to mechatronics curriculum uh, organized around mutually supporting courses. Uh, excellent. Thank, for that. Uh, thank, thank you for that question because we have, as I said before, in the CDIO community, I have, together with my colleagues, uh, uh, written some papers that I can, can share with you. So we have uh, three or four papers uh, that is published and uh, I, I can send it to, to all of you. Uh, uh, as part of this uh, workshop. So you can read more about this thematic and how we did uh, went through this uh, exercise with the mechatronics program. Okay, and of course, any resources, Professor Matz, that you share with us as the uh, program team, we will then make available to the participants uh, through an online link uh, afterwards. Perfect. 
the last comment was from uh, Professor Mohi Mansour. He was uh, he was thanking you, saying that he enjoyed this last session very much, saying that it's uh, an excellent starting point for course organization. I think he was uh, referring specifically to the didactics uh, session that you provide. Mm, thank you so much, and I'm also looking forward to to uh, uh, engage all of you uh, in the room, all 40 participants, to, to think about this. And I think we can make an excellent exercise or assignment uh, during the five-day workshop to discuss this in detail, because it's, it's kind of tricky and it takes some time to understand what we really mean. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Reda Hassan, she, she just wanted to let you know that she didn't hear um, much from you related to your, uh, her comment about CDIO workspaces and what the requirements of CDIO workspaces are. I saw that that's one of the standards that you have covered, um, but you didn't go further into the requirements for CDIO workspace. Did you want to touch on that briefly? Absolutely. Um my understanding of the CDIO uh, standard for workspaces is actually that you can uh, have workspaces for the design and build exercises. Uh, what, so, so that's the, the, the answer on that question. So the workspaces is for the students to uh, have the possibilities to do practical uh, uh, work for, for projects. Um, what I mentioned that I have been involved in uh, specifically at KTH and also uh, in, uh, in Skoltech, even more specifically, is to design all teaching and uh, learning spaces, including designing libraries, designing um, classroom, uh, auditoriums, uh, also uh, workshops uh, for, for uh, prototyping, and, but also uh, flexible uh, workspaces uh, for students to, to have seminars, to have um, uh, co-curricular activities, uh, and also uh, library spaces where they can re reading spaces. And that's not a part of the CDIO workspaces. So this, the CDIO uh, workspaces is more specifically to the design and build. But I have experience on, on uh, designing a full university in terms of all spaces. So I can, we can touch on that uh, during the five-day workshop. Okay. Then we had also um, the difference between the Egyptian system and the Russian Sweden, uh, as uh, Professor something, I didn't make a note of who, who put that question. Dr. Aydish. Yeah. I, I my experience from, from Egypt is from uh, what I learned uh, extensively uh, from the December meeting when I met uh, uh, 10 or 15 people on the one-to-one -one meeting. That was very, very interesting for me and, and a great learning experience. What I learned was mostly from uh, your recently um, development when you, are, when you in Egypt are going moving toward the Bologna process and coming closer to the European system with ECT as credit, with the learning outcomes, uh, with the uh, bachelor, master, PhD programs and so forth and so on. So in that respect, uh, you, your education seems, and also uh, when you are starting to, to uh, have your education all in English, you are moving very rapidly toward what, what we see in, uh, in uh, Sweden and elsewhere in, in Europe, of course, uh, and also in, in US with MIT and, and all the universities in, in that uh, respect. And also, uh, I can tell you that Russia is part of the European uh, Bologna system. So even in Russia, um, they are moving into to, uh, an education in English, so we can share, we can have the mobility of the students, and we can also have the uh, mobility and the employability. So our students who graduate in Egypt could move to Sweden and work and the Swedish student can come to, to Egypt and work because the, the education, uh, engineering education, um, education is, is quite similar nowadays. That makes it also uh, uh, important to have 
diverse programs and diverse uh, uh, programs that is uh, really uh, point pinting point pinting the the uh, need for the society in in the region. So in Russia, we we deliver courses and graduates in oil and gas still, and uh, in in Egypt, I know that we have this energy program now that we are included in uh, with all the demands on the energy side. So so I, I think the difference that I can observe uh, in Egypt and elsewhere is, is uh, minimal, I would say. Then, of course, you have your, your uh, culture traditions that you should uh, be aware of and, and save and so on. We have other uh, traditions, so, uh, but um, that, that's uh, of mutual interest and, and we can learn from each other. Uh, there was another question that came up now, uh, Professor Matz from uh, Professor uh, Nabil Sabri. Uh, is there a repository containing educational materials using CDIO concepts that is open for uh, faculty to access? You can start, uh, actually it was a while ago I was looking into the CDIO community, but in the CDIO community you have uh, a, a folder with the documents and, and uh, learning resources. So start to look in, into that one. Um, so that's the best I can say. We had also so the perfect. question, no, slide please, go number ahead. seven. We had also a question on slide number seven. Uh, yeah. Now I cannot see my slide number, but. Uh, I think it was about uh, Professor Mohi's comment about community service. Yeah. Uh, so Professor Matz, can I, uh, would it be okay with you uh, if once we, um, of course everyone attending this session will be provided uh, a summary of the session with the main highlights, with the materials, with a link to the recording of the session, but also um, perhaps we can provide you with the list of questions. And if you have additional information related to responses for those questions, you could, you could add them and we could make those available to, to the participants as well. Right. And to answer the question on slide seven, uh, I included the, the community service uh, in the outreach, I, I'm not quite sure if it covers exactly the same, but uh, community service is uh, connected to that you, you go outside the university. So it maybe uh, should be included in, in this one. So thank you for, for the question. Great. Thank you. I don't, um... I don't see any additional questions other than the ones we had uh, previously mentioned. Uh, Dr. Mona uh, Abulaiz's question about the um, a, a specific example of a course to show the difference in content and teaching methodology. I'm not sure if you if you have time to address that now, or if you would like to incorporate a specific example in the in the upcoming session. No, I can. I have to think about it. So. Okay. Thank you for the question and I will uh, follow up on that one. Okay. Great. I'm just trying to monitor the chat. Okay, so I think that uh, that completes the set of questions uh, that we've received. We do absolutely encourage everyone to please uh, come join our, our session, our session two on June 22nd. Um, thank you for participating, Professor Matz. Would you like to say anything else before we, we complete today's session? No, I think uh, it was an uh, experience for me also to have this two hour session and uh, I'm happy to have feedback on, on uh, what we can improve because we need to improve all the time. So thank you for, for listening and uh, I also like to, to uh, finish on time. So uh, before on time. So <laughs> no, we are on time. Awesome. And yeah, so that's fine. So I'm looking forward to, to get feedback and see you in two weeks. Yes, we encourage everyone who participated, if you have feedback on uh, things we can incorporate in the next session or even feedback on this current session and how we can improve the rest, uh, please do contact us. Uh, we're, we're happy to hear from you. Thank you very much, Professor Matz. Thank you very Thank much you. to our uh, participant faculty. 
and we look forward to session number two on June 22nd. Thank you all very much. <laughs>